Hello, everyone. This is Wes Miller with Pigskins and Pageantry, a podcast dedicated to all things SEC football and proud member of Blue Wire Hustle. Join me, Jesse, and Matt each week as we discuss last week's games, news around the league, predictions for next week's matchups, and more. And what's up, everybody? It is Wes. Week four is in the books already. Seems like just the other day we were like college football is never going to be here and we're already through four weeks now already it's it's insane lots of crazy uh crazy games uh that occurred last weekend lots of really odd finishes and teams struggling that you wouldn't expect to struggle but first before we get into all that as always uh joining me jesse what is going on i feel like with the new weather i feel like we got our first taste of fall this past week um, and spooky season is upon us, and I feel like that caused some very spooky things to occur around the conference, um, and some things that I called. Well, there were definitely some terrified teams around the league this weekend. <laughs> what, what's going on, Matt? How you doing? I'm doing all right. I had to lay out of work today because I did something on my back, but aside from that, uh, I'm doing all right. Still smarting from that loss to Florida. That one hurt a little bit. Not going yeah. to you, but yeah, we roll with the punches. We keep keep on and keeping on. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that one. And uh, but I mean, honestly, I didn't think it was all bad things for Tennessee. No, it it wasn't. Mm-hmm. We had oh. a lead at one point, so yeah, yeah, that's better than it's been for several years now. Right, right, right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about those games. Always remember, if you ain't first, you're last. All right, the first game we'll talk about was uh, LSU at Mississippi State last week, which uh, was a close one. LSU won it 28-25, to 25, uh, Jesse getting the point in this one. Um, there was like, you know, I know we've talked about Mississippi State's defense or their lack thereof, uh, but they had a bunch of defensive miscues in this game. Some of them like glaring, one of them uh, where the receiver was basically open uh, with not a defender in frame. <laughs> Um, So kind of some embarrassing defensive play there from Mississippi State. Uh, LSU, honestly, not playing a a ton of great defense either, uh, but doing enough uh, to come out uh, on top. I mean, both quarterbacks, if you look at their stats, kind of lit things up. You got uh, Max Johnson, 280 yards, four touchdowns and a pick. And then on the other side, you had Will Rogers, uh, 371 yards, uh, three touchdowns and a pick. So, I mean – you know, not a ton of defense uh, going on between these two teams. But, uh, Matt, let me let me start with you first on this one. Uh, what were your thoughts on this one and uh, LSU's uh, ability to come out on top? Well, we had a feeling this was going to be a close game. I think all of us in our picks last week said it was going to be. Um, I was anticipating LSU to win this one, obviously, as we'll, with the pick and we know that. Um, I, I have to say this is a good, good rebound for Mississippi State, especially after that. Didn't they? They lost last week, didn't they? To um, that was was that Memphis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that was yeah, the Memphis yeah, yeah, yeah. game, right? I think it was. Yeah. So that this is a good bounce back. You've got you're in your division. They lost Memphis 31-29. Just pulled it up. Um, you you get get back into the division play, and they took LSU to the wire here. Um, started to come back on them um, there towards the end, but uh, they're probably a little bit too late uh, as far as that goes. By the way, Will Rogers threw 62 passes in this game. Do you think he has to go sit like, like you ever seen Major League? You know where the guys are getting in the whirlpool. Like I feel like yeah. that's what he has to do. I think he threw um, 69 the week before because it was almost 70. I remember something like it's, that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a lot. It's a lot either way you cut it. Um, <laughs> but not a not a great night for offense for either or excuse me for defense on either team. 486 yards total offense from Mississippi State, 343 yards from uh, LSU. So. Oof. <laughs> Again, we don't do defenses as much as we used to. Um, but I, I say this is a good win for for LSU. You know, inter, interdivision wins are usually pretty hard fought games, and this one was. Yeah. Um, Jesse, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I don't know if it speaks more to um, some improvement by Mississippi State or just the state of affairs at LSU. Still, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Um, the Tigers, obviously, they they didn't look great early on. Um, they were able to kind of pull it out, showing some more patience in the pocket. Um, they did execute some big plays when they needed to. Uh, and I think this was a really big win for Coach O. I think his seat was starting to get a little warm 
Um, and it, it still might be a little warm because just to be honest, a win against Mississippi State right now is not something necessarily to hang your hat on. Um, but again, had they lost, it would have been a lot worse. But for them to remain relevant, they're going to have to clean it up a lot. And then for Mississippi State, again, this is now um, two straight losses in winnable games. Uh, so mm. their schedule just continues to get tougher as we go throughout the season. I do not have high hopes for them, and that makes me sad for Mike Leach and his future in the SEC. Yeah, um, I think I actually picked Mississippi State in this one. I'm not sure. Either either I picked them or I was really hoping. I'm pretty sure I picked them, though. I think um, you might have. But, but let's not forget that, you know, obviously this was the game leading off last year where they shocked the nation in beating LSU. Mm. Um, so I'm sure that was still in, the, in both teams' minds coming in, honestly. So, um, yeah, I mean, good win for LSU. Feel bad for Mississippi State. I mean, this is, like you said, another close one. Uh, that they lost, they could uh, easily be four and zero right now. Um, so yeah. it's kind of kind of wild. Let's keep in mind that this is an LSU team that had an eighteen point lead going into the fourth quarter because they scored. Uh, looking at the scoring guide, they scored with eleven and a half minutes left in the fourth, mm -hmm. and yeah. Mississippi State almost came back and won this thing. If they'd had a little bit more time, they scored uh, two touchdowns with under seven minutes left. So pretty close, pretty close. Mm hmm. Yep. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to Mizzou uh, at Boston College. And uh, Jesse got the point in this one because Boston College won 41 to 34 uh, in overtime. She was the only one to pick at Boston College. And, and, and Matt, I don't mean to bring up the past, but I think on the last show, you said they don't do football in New England at the collegiate level. <laughs> I'll which, wear that one. Which is probably uh, still fair, given that they beat Mizzou. Which, look, I just could, could grieve. I mean, I'm, I'm baffled at Mizzou's defense. They continue to kind of fall. Um, used to be good under Barry Odom, and now we've watched them just, you know, go downhill so fast. Uh, yeah, just like that. Um, now, I, I feel bad for Harrison uh, Mavis, who made the 56-yard field goal for Mizzou to tie it up. At, uh, at 34. I mean, because it was a heck of a kick. Uh, they kind of had that momentum with, with that, you know, going on. And then uh, Boston College scored a touchdown after that. Okay, you know, Mizzou's got a chance uh, to tie it at least, you know. But then Connor Basilak just like, he just went for it all, threw it to the end zone. And honestly, it wasn't a very high percentage pass. I mean, it was in, uh, I think there was two defenders over there and it definitely wasn't anywhere close to the receiver and it got picked and the game was over. I just remember I was just so, so disappointed and felt so bad uh, for Mizzou and especially the kicker. Um, but um, I don't really know what to make of this one. You, you, you go there and um, from what I've heard, um, it was not a good look for uh, Eli Drinkwitz either because he was kind of like questioning, why do we even have this game? Uh, why do we have to travel up here? It's not going to help our recruiting. And it That's really not something you want to hear your head coach say. It was no. really kind of a. He was sassing on social leading yeah. up to it. It was not cute. When I think it was kind of some parting shots at the uh, was it the the AD who's now fired who scheduled this the one who scheduled this game is gone now. So I, you know, it is what it is, and it's kind of an odd thing to say though. Still, and certainly doesn't get your team fired up. <laughs> so it's not a good precedent to set for your players. That's not, not an example you follow. Not to right. mention drink. Didn't drink what's come from Appalachian state. Yeah. And they come from these small schools that have to travel to these big schools. And it's part of their lifeblood of keeping their programs alive. I don't know why, why he would say boo about having to play what I would call a smaller school. Cause I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember the last time Boston college's name came up in probably when Matt Ryan played national. for them. <laughs> oh, I forgot oh about gosh, that. I forgot that he was, did. That was like what, oh four, oh five. So it's been a couple decades. Since then. <laughs> it's been a minute, yeah. Uh, but Jesse, let me start with you first on this uh, on this game. What were your thoughts on uh, on the outcome? It was a roller coaster of emotions. It was of of plays of everything. I mean, what an exciting win for Boston College, though. It, Matt made a good oh, point. Yeah. This is what keeps these programs alive. They make a lot of money to play these games. Um, and so honestly, like, yes, someone beat a, a team in our conference, but good for them. Um, it was, you know, 41 to 34. That's so much offense. Um, nine lead changes, three turnovers, 
and a go-ahead touchdown with 25 seconds left, a game-tying field goal as time expired, and a walk-off interception. Mm-hmm. All of that in one game. That's insane. Yeah. Um, I just – it's like you said, the defense has just continued to go downhill for Mizzou. When I was at Alabama, they were definitely the ones to watch out for in the East towards you know the end of my collegiate time. And I just do not feel like they have – kept up that momentum um and honestly i'm not really impressed with basilac i don't know how he will do in the draft i know that's far away but if his stock doesn't start rising and his team doesn't start doing better i don't see it going very well yeah i seem to remember like the time frame that you're talking about mizzou was known for like a smash mouth run game mm-hmm. in, in your face and and tough defense and i knew that it was one of those games where at the beginning of the season, you know, you look at the schedule and you're like, oh, yeah, Georgia shouldn't have a problem with them. Uh, but then you start getting up to it. and You're like, you know, this this is a tough opponent. This is not just yeah. an easy win. So, uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on kind of the, the change that's happened? Uh, and especially as it relates to the outcome of this game? Well, I could tell you that Missouri, Missouri is one of those teams that when we brought them in from the they were the Big 12, I think, originally. Um, when we brought Missouri in, it didn't make sense. I don't see why they like they how they fit in. But Missouri carved out a space in the East. Um, they've mm-hmm. made themselves, you know, kind of that mid tier kind of uh, SEC team where they can kind of surprise some people. And didn't and, they even uh, represent the East in the one? They did. Yeah, I think it was sixteen or it 15, was, 15, I think it, was. it was technically fifteen. Um, I was at that game. It was Alabama yeah. in the West. Yeah, because it wasn't a game, as I recall. Right? It wasn't a game. No, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't a game. But they did well leading up in, right. to that game. Yeah. Right. But this is a Missouri team that I think should have won this football game. Um, that throw in overtime, just throwing a Hail Mary up into the end zone at the very beginning of the overtime for uh, Connor Bazelak doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. why you go – like hardcore like yard like that it just doesn't it doesn't compute something's not clicking about what should be happening in that particular regard so i mean kudos to boston college for getting the job done but i i feel like missouri has kind of let themselves down they let the conference down um and again i think we said last year was it connor Bazelak supposed to be like the guy we were looking out for this season yeah um yeah. and granted i just pulled up his um his season stats so far uh, hold on, it's loading. Um, he's thrown for at this point 1200 yards, uh, 10 touchdowns, three interceptions with a QB rating of 76. Uh, it's mid tier. I would, I would, I would be hesitant to call that uh, elite. And we were talking about how Bazelak last season looked elite. Um, so I'm, I'm not real sure what the story is there. I would almost say, argue, make the argument that he's probably regressed a little bit. Um, I don't know. I just have not been overly impressed with what I've seen out of Missouri over the past couple of games. And, um, you know, they, they, they lost to Kentucky. They, they barely beat central Michigan. They um, lost to an ACC mid tier uh, mid tier conference team. So I don't, I don't see Missouri having a whole lot of success this season based off their body of work thus far. Right. Yeah. It's been kind of disappointing to see. And I wonder I mean, obviously, I know Drinkwitz hasn't been there a, a long time uh, to evaluate, but I just I wonder what the what the mood is up there, uh, and how people are are perceiving his tenure thus far. So if you um, have guys that start regressing, um, and an entire side of the football defense start regressing. I, I would be very upset, uh, fan, if I were them, and I would start to feel a little bit of heat. Because mm-hmm. to me, that tells me that you cannot foster and develop talent. You can see it. You can maybe recruit it, but you're not you're not doing anything with it once you get it. Right. It's not a good look. Yeah, so we'll just kind of have to uh, monitor that. It's been something interesting to note, you know, so far in this season, but we'll see how that pattern, if it continues or not. So um, next, let's talk about, uh, at the time, number seven, Texas A&M uh, versus number 16, Arkansas. Yes, sir. Uh, I was waiting for it. <laughs> at uh, at Jerry's World, as he uh, let them play in his palace of a stadium. Um, Arkansas, oh, he's an Arkansas. So happy. Yeah, he, they he got is. beer. 
Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, he's going to say he's an alumnus of Arkansas. So he, you know, he was excited. So um, Arkansas got off to a fast start in this game, including the 85 yard touchdown uh, from KJ Jefferson to Traylon Burks, uh, who we've talked about a lot on this show and, uh, and a wide receiver who, to keep your eye on. Um, they even led 17 nothing at one point in this game. So obviously uh, A&M was able to kind of chip away at the lead, but uh, KJ Jefferson, he had to come out of the game for a little bit. Um, he had a, I think it was, was it a bruised knee or something, something with that, uh, with that knee. He had a uh, knee and uh, his ankle got taped. Mm, yeah. And then he came back in the game and he got some, some difficult yards and, and kind of helped uh, close out the game. Uh, but uh, Arkansas winning 20 to 10. And uh, I got the point in this one. Um, for the first time in nine years, Arkansas beats A&M. And that's since A&M has been in the, in the league. So every time they have played in the SEC, yeah. uh, A&M has beat them, but, uh, but not this time. A&M, man, the, the tackling was just horrible. And I, I don't know if you guys saw this particular play. So, but the push? I don't even know what this guy was trying to do. He's like, it he, was the push. He, yeah, he had the guy. He had the guy dead. If he just wraps up right there, no more. But instead, he pushes him like towards the end zone, and he just I know it was based like on a his feet. And, bottle, little, little boost. It was so weird. Was um, he trying to push him out of bounds? I think he was trying to push him out of bounds, but it wasn't hard enough it to push him was, over. And if anything, it it wasn't in the right direction. <laughs> it so it was just which all of that is is resolved if you just you know do a textbook tackle wrap them up whatever um so i mean so it's kind of twofold here a and m a ton of mistakes here so and, and we can definitely talk about those but also obviously good on arkansas um you know for uh four and oh um and just i mean just a great show and nobody expected this from them this season mm -hmm. and they uh were rewarded with number eight in the ap poll this week so um so if you if you've uh, followed Sam Pittman, whether it be uh, as O-line coach at Georgia or wherever he's been, uh, or even on this show, you'll be familiar with uh, with this kind of uh, quote from him. Yes, sir. You're familiar with that, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with this <laughs> other saying of his that he says a ton. And if you watched game day, I think you saw it as well. I think they showed it there as well, but uh, here it is. Have you ever heard him say that? Apparently, that's also a thing. No. So, uh, yeah, turn <laughs> the jukebox, jukebox on. So, um, so uh, kind of cool. There's going to be a time when he's coaching a team and they don't know what a jukebox is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's but, coming soon. I'm, I was going to say, even now, some of them are probably like, oh, is that that thing that we saw in the movie that one time? You know, <laughs> like, sure, whatever. Yeah. I don't care. All it means is that we won a game and he's excited. So, um Matt, let's start with you first on this one. What are your thoughts on uh, Arkansas beating AM? Big win for Arkansas, big win for Coach Pittman. Um, I'm really excited to see what this team's going to do. Big game this weekend coming up. Um, two undefeated teams in Arkansas and Georgia. So that'll be a, a, a slobber knocker, as they like to say in professional wrestling. <laughs> um, the thing <laughs> I was looking, I didn't have a chance to watch this particular game, but uh, I was looking at a couple of different things on the stat lines and the box score and whatnot. So Texas A&M comes out and does nothing on offense. Their first, first series of punt, second series punts, third series punt, fourth series punt, fifth series punt. It takes them six series to finally go nine plays, 46 yards for a field goal. So they go into the half down 17 to three and they got another touchdown and it was a long one, it looks like, a 67-yard scamper by Isaiah, uh, Isaiah Spiller. So you take away that big play, Our, Texas A&M didn't do nothing. Arkansas <laughs> was able to suffocate that offense, um, and I'm sure old Jimbo was less than thrilled about that. I, um, I'm excited to see what Arkansas is going to be able to do. Um, you know, being in the SEC West, they've still got some big names to play with. They've still got to take care of Bama. They've still got to take care of Auburn. Um, they still have to worry about Ole Miss. So it's it's going to be an uphill battle for Arkansas, but they're scrappy. And um, I'm really excited to see what they're going to have. And, uh, and that defense held uh, Texas A&M to under 300 yards, which in the SEC nowadays, that's that's a great day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And um, 
I don't know. I just had a real feeling, and I can't remember if I mentioned this on the show last week, but I have the feeling that A&M is just not as good as people think they are, and Arkansas is better than people think they are. And um, yeah. I think that's – I mean, obviously, I got the, the point in this one, but you can just kind of tell just kind of the way these two teams were trending um, that something was brewing bad for A&M. Uh, Jesse, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I feel like we've been saying that in the past couple of seasons, or maybe it's just me, um, <laughs> that A&M is not as good as everybody thinks. Jimbo hater in the house. I am a Jimbo hater, and I, I just be glad you weren't with me. I thought it was so funny. I enjoyed this game <laughs> so very much. Um, but a fun stat that I saw is the Aggies have allowed, or had allowed, 232 yards passing total in their first three games. The only team in the country allowing fewer than 100 a game. Arkansas had 229 yards passing at halftime. Mm. So I don't know what was in the water, what wasn't in the water. I don't know. Um, but it's like you said, they were not wrapping up on tackles. There was a lot of mental errors that I saw on the Texas A&M side. I was not impressed with uh, Calzada. I did not think he had a lot of uh, composure, didn't seem to be in control of the game or of the offense. Um, there was just a lot there that I, I, I didn't – I wouldn't be confident in him – um, but KJ Jefferson, I was very impressed with, I loved his moxie throughout the game going in there with, you know, he was hurting his knee, his ankle, both, whatever. Um, and to kind of finish out the game and finish out those drives and really get a lot of that yardage to end the game. I was really impressed with him. Um, I thought he did a really great job and I'm excited for Arkansas. I think we had looked at them and we're like, Ooh, they've got a tough schedule and they do. Um, but I think they're going to handle it a lot better than we thought they would. And I think we also looked at Georgia's schedule and thought, wow, well, you know, they, they've just got cupcake after cupcake. And they right. do. But Arkansas may not be one of those cupcakes like they yeah. thought they would they're, be. So Arkansas I'm, is going to end up being a cupcake they choke on if they're not careful. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I think, like, what a great story. Um, how great for them to jump so far in the, yeah. in the rankings. Uh, this is a long time coming for Arkansas. And, I love the the SEC short. So Arkansas is moving out of the basement. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was great. Meanwhile, Florida State is uh, is moving into the basement. <laughs> mm. uh, By the but, way, guys, I want I want to point out one thing before we move on that in this game, Arkansas scored more points than the previous three teams that Texas A and M faced all season. Mm. So they wow. gave up ten points to Kent, seven points to Colorado. They shut out North Mex uh, New Mexico, and then Arkansas scored twenty in in the game so definitely a little bit difference in talent level that yeah. you're looking at versus what they were playing against yep. earlier in the season i think AM might be paper tiger i really think so i agree and as if they are a paper tiger then they're, they're not going to be able to threaten bama and auburn and now arkansas did you hear <laughs> jimbo um I, I don't remember if it was his half to, i don't remember what interview it was it may have been after the game he spoke so quickly it was like he was um an auctioneer he was like that's, that's <laughs> and we were like he talks what? Really fast. and they went into um the studio and they're like well um he, jimbo basically said everything we were gonna say but much faster <laughs> it's like if a used car salesman was an auctioneer that would be yeah. jimbo's speech pattern so <laughs> yeah um <laughs> I'm curious. I, I want to know what their options are at quarterback uh, because uh, obviously Zach Calzada has come in and not been impressive at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, kudos to him for stepping in, but ever since uh, Haynes King went down um, and I was going to say, even with Haynes King, they weren't great, but they've definitely dropped off since Calzada has come on. So uh, I'm just mm -hmm. uh, interested to know what options they have, if there is anybody else. And, um, you know, like we said before, this is Jimbo Fisher. He's supposed to be the quarterback guy. That's why they brought him in, you know, or one of the many reasons that they paid him <laughs> to come in was because of stuff like that. So um, it'd be interesting to, to watch that and see if they're, I don't know if the third string has anything uh, to, to offer or what. <clears throat> Maybe they have a grad student or like a grad yeah. assistant. Yeah, grad assistant. Break. Yeah, put on the pads, put away the clipboard, put on the pads. Let's not do that again. We already tried that with Carolina. <laughs> worked out okay for them. won a so, game. Yeah. yeah. It worked out for a while. Um, all right. Let's get to Georgia State at uh, Auburn. 
uh, Auburn winning this one 34 24 and it was not um as stupid uh, I was gonna say it was not as out of reach as the score indicates on there no um yeah the uh, uh unbelievable if anybody had a chance to watch this one unbelievable ending which you know you're not sitting there on the what was that was that like the three thirty, or that was like the four o'clock window or whatever, mm-hmm. whenever that game was. And, um, you know, you're sitting there and you're not expecting this one to be an exciting one at all. And then it just continues. It continues. Um, Georgia state continues to score. Auburn can't really do anything offensively. Their defense has no answer for Georgia state. And we kind of made fun of Georgia state's coach a little bit in the last show, but maybe he knew something when we did apparently. Something, yeah. <laughs> It, I don't know what, but it, but he he's got it. And uh, man, if they can play with that intensity the rest of the season, who knows what they'll uh, they'll do? I guess. But uh, but yeah. So like I said, Auburn's offense not really going anywhere. So in order to try to spark the team, Brian Harson brings in LSU transfer T.J. Finley, and he did lead them on a uh, on a comeback drive, which concluded with an insane play where he uh, was scrambling for his life. And managed to find the, the open man in the end zone. So um, really, just needed to wrap up on a tackle. That was I, it. I know, right? And that like was they, it. like they had him. <laughs> and look, I'm not saying that I was hoping Auburn was going to lose, but it was just kind of like it was just one of those like crazy moments. You're like, oh my gosh, is this about to happen? As he's scrambling it was an for Auburn his life. Moment. It's the thing that only Auburn it, does it, in Jordan. In hair. Jordan hair, you you that said it, it exactly. It and was uh, the whole thing. Oh my gosh. Obviously they pulled ahead with a pick six after that, but, but man, Stupid. to think it was that close, it, it's just, it's just insane to think that one, a game that we were kind of laughing about last week uh, ended up being one that it came down to literally like their last, you know, prayer there. <laughs> I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> not a, not a don't prayer. Yeah. <gasps> anyway. Um, so uh, Jesse, since Matt is apparently out of the window for right now. <laughs> um, now I'm on bye-bye. Yeah, uh, we'll, um, we'll wait for him as he gets back. But what were your thoughts on this one? I, first of all, like it should have never gotten to the point where, where they needed to wrap up on a tackle because the play before that was quite literally an incomplete pass. Everyone knows it. The announcers knew it. Everyone knew it, but they're injured in hair and they get this completion that is not a completion. Um, and you will never be able to convince me otherwise. And then we go into that play where we've got him pushed back. Uh, There's a lot of pressure and then they don't wrap up on a tackle. He throws it and it's like, you know, then it starts to deflate Um, and then they get the pick six and it's insane. But that game should have never been that close. If Auburn is who everyone says they are, it should have never, ever been that close. Um, Oh, I agree. I I love that you said we, though when you said that he was uh he was on the ropes that we had him we, we had him. <laughs> i know i feel like i i'm not one of those people that would have gone to like um the penn, penn state, state game and dressed in white <laughs> but like the girl might have gone and dressed in georgia state gear i don't know <laughs> yeah well, you know supporting a, whatever but I'm uh from georgia it's fine but yeah how, uh, makes sense that literally only happens to auburn in jordan hair and i know that Gus is gone and we're not burning sweater vest anymore, but they have found something. Um, I don't know what it is. It's not a sweater vest, but they've found some sort of juju. Either it wasn't Gus, either it wasn't Gus all along or Brian Harson has found his own thing to do. I think we need to figure out what that might be. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe but even, he texted Gus. I don't know. Oh, that's true. Maybe. Of course, I don't know. Of course, I mean, you know, Gus is at a conference, so maybe he would be okay with sharing that. I don't Where know. is he again? He's at UCF. Remember, UCF, that's he's it. standing on he's standing on the field that has the fake national championship sign above him, and there's the meme that says, "Ironically, this is Gus's fault." <laughs> so, <laughs> says, right? Uh, yeah. So, the the irony, um, but no, we're we're not the only ones who talk about this when it comes yeah. to uh, to Auburn getting the calls, because I was listening to uh, Paul Feinbaum on the uh, uh, ESPN oh. podcast. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> for those of you uh, listening and cannot appreciate, uh, Matt just had, was that, that was the window from the office, wasn't it? The interviews, I love it. 
It's a great visual. I hope he leaves that up because it's classic. It's classic, uh, classic show material. Yeah, leave it. Leave. leave I love it. it. I love it. I, you, you, must do, I don't, I don't you must do. I don't. You must do the rest of the yet. show. You must do the rest of the show like that because it's the best thing ever. Um, but yeah, we were talking about how like we're not the only ones who say this that 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 Auburn gets the calls. Paul Feinbaum said that on the podcast on Sunday. He was like, I don't know why, but it just seems like Auburn always gets the calls. So it's they not do. just us. <laughs> No, but another thing is, um, I think Bo Nix lost his job. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, he he I gone. He gone. And we'll talk a little, about, a little bit more because uh, the game next week just got a little bit, or a lot of it, more interesting uh, with that change or with that How probable change. How old is change. TJ Finley? What year is he? Um, gosh, I don't remember what year he was when he transferred. I don't have it written down there i don't think you know, all i know is LSU i'm just wondering if there's going to be any transfer portal drama to look forward to surely not with bo nix oh oh, fun. oh yeah yeah i gosh fun. now here um well hold on let's let's get you matt what are your thoughts about this game first and then i have a, a thought about bo nix and uh nil go ahead uh, I, you know, as a, as a fan of a team that's lost to one of these teams that you have no business being in a competitive game with, I feel for Auburn fans. I know that was uh, kind of embarrassing. I don't know why that happened. Um, to be honest, you shouldn't have struggled that much with the Georgia State team, especially after some of the things their coaches said this week. Um, that should have been motivation by itself to come in and put exactly. 60 points on them, which that team and that, that offense has been capable of doing. But I, I put I chalk a lot of this up to the fact this is a hangover from Penn State. That was a tough loss for Auburn. That was one of those situations where they were they were in a position to win that football game and couldn't finish the deal. I think I, I lean more towards that end of things than anything else. So, um, do I put a lot of stock in this loss? Do I think this is going to be an indication how how Auburn's going to be the rest of the year? No, I think this was an aberration. I think Auburn will rebound pretty easily. Um, but it's got to be a little disconcerting, to say the least. Yeah. Um, I think I'm actually going to save that comment for later. We just came up with an opinion segment on the fly. So, um, <clears throat> all right, let's get to okay. the next game, Tennessee at Florida. Florida winning this one 38-14, which it is, it is what it is with the score. But uh, Matt and I both had the differential. And doing the math, we actually both got the point this time. So, hey. yeah. If you guys both get the point next time, you guys should just cancel each other out, and then I get the point. Yeah, no, I mean, or no, we can no, both. No. Neither of us can get the point this time. Whatever y'all agree to, I don't really care. So, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'd I'd rather just go ahead and get your because I'm sure you were, you know, caught up in this game. I, I watched it, but I'm sure you were more much more in depth. So, Matt, what are your what are your thoughts? Um. I hate to say moral victory. I hate to use that term, but I felt like that through going into half, um, you know, where we were with them, we were only down by three points going into half. I felt like we were doing pretty good. Um, let's keep in mind this is a Tennessee team that is depleted as far as talent goes. We've had a lead loss. I think there's no other – they said it during the broadcast that Tennessee's lost like eight starters to the transfer portal or something like that mm. um, this past season with the turnover from between – Coach Pruitt and Coach Heupel. Um, I, I felt like we did a pretty good job in the first half. Uh, I felt like we stuck with them. Um, defense got some stops when they needed to get some stops. The offense was able to get some points on the board. Um, it just wasn't meant to be. We weren't able to finish the thing off. Um, and I think what it boiled down to was their effort in the second half. They, their defense made alterations, and they came out and they pitched a shutout in the third and fourth quarter. Uh, they controlled the game clock, 35 minutes to our 24 minutes. Um, we had more penalties than they did. They, they had more yards than we did. Although we still gained 423 yards on 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 uh, that particular game. So not awful. By the way, uh, a little offensive, offended by some of Todd Grantham, um, some of the shade that he threw at uh, Tennessee. What did he uh, say? At, after that game, let me find um, – this is from a Saturday down because South, South, nothing, Florida. nothing that you could tell me about Todd Grantham would surprise me. This is the, <laughs> this is the same guy who, uh, when he was on Georgia's staff, I can't remember who we were playing. I think it was, it was somebody. Anyway, the, uh, kicker was going for a kick to, uh, either tie it or win it for the other team. 
and he was out there on the field on the sidelines going like this he's, and saying you're gonna effing choke to the to the kicker. i remember that that's jealousy <gasps> That's true. Yeah. I remember that. And I just remember how embarrassing that was as a Georgia fan to uh, have him doing antics like that on the sidelines. So it uh, doesn't surprise me in the least, whatever he had to say. Well, well, when somebody asked him uh, yesterday how they were preparing for Chris Rodriguez and um, Wondell Robinson from Kentucky for this weekend, uh, and he said, quote, it's a much more difficult challenge than, say, last week, unquote. Oh, um, oh gosh. Yeah, let me let me let me run this back. Rude. Right Todd, let me run this down for you, kid. We're a team that's not in a good place right now. We haven't been in a good place for a while. Um, we are a team that's depleted talent wise. We have talent, but we lost a lot of our good talent. One of our best defensive players decided to go play for our biggest rival. So we're in kind of a crappy spot. Um, we still gained 423 yards and still put two touchdowns in the end zone on your defense. So, Mr. Grantham, if uh, if you're listening to this, piss off. Yeah, and um, he's got no room that's, to talk. That's that's not that's not what you should have said in that situation. Yeah, um, and Vol Twitter was all about that. Oh. And and I will yes, be watching Vol Twitter. I will be watching that Kentucky game this weekend. I hope Kentucky hangs 35. Hours. Oh man, yeah, I. I just don't. So this is coming from a from a guy who um, his defense has been not great last year, especially sus. this year. And yeah, definitely sus. This year a little bit better so far, but still Jerry's out kind of. But um, I mean, this this is the same dude whose seat was hot, and many were were calling for him to be fired um, at the end of last year, and wanted Mullen to go with somebody else. So. Uh, the fact that he's smarting off about, you know, a, a good game or a, a, a win, not even a great game for the defense. Like you said, they still gave up 420 something yards um, to a Tennessee team that's been depleted, as you said. I, I just don't understand that. I felt like Tennessee hung pretty well in this game, at least obviously the first half. They only trailed 17 14 at half. Um, right. and, I felt and it would have been, it would have been a tighter score if we'd had a couple more things go our way. There were a couple of, um, there were a couple of drives that got stalled because of bad plays or penalties or something like that. So I feel like we could have had the lead. Uh, and I'd said this, I think I told y'all this, I think that Florida team that particular day against Tennessee was beatable. Um, but I just don't think that we had the, had the horsepower to put it all together. When you mentioned this adjustments year. and I think that the, that Florida made the adjustments on offense too, because it seemed like they kind of came out swinging. They had that trick play that uh, was, you know, obviously they're kind of going for the jugular with stuff like that. Um, and I was, I had this thought and you kind of just confirmed it a little bit ago. I was wondering if depth was the factor, but obviously if so many yeah. people have gone to the transfer portal, obviously that's going to affect you in that. I in mean, that or well, look at Cooper Mays, Cooper Mays was Cooper Mays stayed in the entire game injured. Mm -hmm. He's out there hobbling in between plays. I've, I've got visions of I saw that with Jim Marshall back in the late nineties. Like it was, mm -hmm. he was, he wouldn't come out. And I think, Heupel or one of the assistant coaches said, Mays, come out. And he said, no, I'm not getting out of this game. So, right. So, I mean, I, I, think, I don't see how, what we're doing there. Yeah. I don't, I like, like you said, I know you're not looking for a moral victory, but I did feel like they played better. And perhaps in, in other years, they, they would have just maybe got blown out instead of uh, the score that you, that you saw, which is a little bit closer. Uh, Jesse, what were your thoughts about this one? Yeah. I thought Florida gave up a few big plays early. Um, again, it's a defense thing, right? Uh, and so just to hear that Grantham's speaking like that, first of all, it's just not classy in general. Um, I, he's, I, he's not I exactly can't imagine, a classy guy. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I can't imagine Nick Saban or any of our coordinators aside from Lane when he was there. That's a completely different story. And we tried, we didn't let him talk to the press. But yeah. there was reason for that. I, I just don't think that sets the a good precedent for your players. I don't think it's something to look up to. I think you should respect every team that you play and know that they, um, they have something to offer and it's whether it's a, a tough game or not, you know, who cares? It's not something that you should say. Um, I also think that if, if they're truly going to be the people to beat in the SEC East, then they are, they're going to have to do better on defense. And I know I'm saying this as an Alabama fan who that game was way too close, but different week. Um, we are very passionate about talking about Florida's defense right now, <laughs> um, but they really are going to have to clean up things on defense. Um, and I think 
they have a cornerback that should be coming back in. He was out with a sprained knee. I'm sorry if I'm going to say his name wrong. Uh, Kair Elam. Kair Elam. I think that'll help. You got me. I'm so I don't, sorry I'm if not I said. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Apologies, but he did miss the game, and I do. I do agree. I think it's something that Tennessee should at least be encouraged by. I don't think that it was as bad as it looks in the score. I think there's I a lot encouraged. of positive points. I felt fine with it. Yeah, I, I think this is trending in the right direction. Mm-hmm. That's that's a good way to put it, I think. Um, all right, uh, let's talk about Kentucky at South Carolina. Um, this game was fairly close. Uh, Kentucky winning at 16 to 10. Um, so just kind of a, an odd feel offensively in this game. Uh, obviously, Kentucky had some offensive struggles. Um, Will Levis, who we've seen have good games and, and some not so great games, only threw for um, 102 yards and a pick. Um, however, kind of like we've seen, sometimes when the passing game isn't on, the running game uh, does well. And Rodriguez had another pretty good game, 26 carries, 144 yards. So uh, I think that kind of shored things up at least enough uh, to, uh, to get done what they need, needed to. Uh, but Kentucky's got to take better care of the ball. I mean, uh, obviously they had the pick and then they had a couple of fumbles as well. Um, So thankfully the defense played well um, and, uh, uh, and and helped them in this game. But, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about how Kentucky has had that defense in the past, uh, in in years past to to lean on. And Saturday's definitely looked a little bit closer to that. So uh, Jesse, what were your thoughts on, on this game? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, Kentucky did just enough to get by, but they have so much to work on. I think, like you said, first of all, ball security. You What? You can't have that many throws. You can't fumble the ball like that. Stop. Hold you can afford that it. against a team like South Carolina. You can't do that against like an you, Alabama or Florida. No, I don't know if Stoops needs to maybe, you know, in practice this week, get a ball and dunk it in melted butter and then just be like hold on to it just just i don't know i don't know what the drill is for this but that would be my suggestion um maybe kfc has some like grease you can borrow i'm not Ooh. entirely sure um they're in kentucky they stretch the field you know i think the thing is is it's like you talked about the run game starts to get better as the passing decreases and levis has not been completely accurate in the passing game and the run game has had to step up but they are gonna have to learn to stretch the field because if not when they start to play really lights out defenses that shut that run game down they have to adapt and right now I'm not convinced that Levis can do that with his accuracy um because it's just it's just not there yet and then like you said their defense has saved the day but that defense is not going to be able to save the day against everyone it'll work against the South Carolina but when they go to play other other teams it's just not going to work so Kentucky I was very excited at the beginning of the season for you but we've got a lot of things to work on in uh this week four or yeah four progress report Mm -hmm. and somehow with all this craziness they're they're four and oh right so um right (laughs) Matt what are your thoughts on this one well, I think this is a Kentucky team that got lucky. They were playing. They played that way against South Carolina. You could, like I said, you can afford to make mistakes like that against Carolina because Carolina, unfortunately, is in a position to do much about it. Um, this is a Kentucky team that struggled the last couple of weeks. Um, remember, they had that struggle win. Looking at you, struggle me. win. Uh, <laughs> struggle win against UTC last week, um, and then Excellent. the week before that, they they didn't beat Missouri by a whole lot. Um, And I think what they're having to do is they're having to lean on Chris Rodriguez quite a bit. I just ran the numbers. He's averaging 128 uh, yards a game right now, which for for a running back is pretty dang good. Um, But the problem is, is that those numbers are coming against teams that are subpar. They haven't run into a a juggernaut yet. I don't know what they're going to look like against Florida this weekend, Um, but they're going to have to up their game a little bit. Definitely going to have to do a little bit better, especially protecting the ball. Um, and especially being able, like Jesse said, to stretch the field. Um, cause you're, cause here's the problem. If your entire run game is centered around, or if your entire offense is centered around the run, Florida's just going to load the box up on you and then yeah. make you throw it. And then if you, Levis can't handle the load, then that's obviously going to lead turnovers, which is going to lead to points, which is going to lead to a lose, a loss. 
Um, so yeah, Kentucky's got some work to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of the uh, blowouts that uh, occurred. You know, so I didn't say less competitive games this time, Matt. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's, we're not PC around here. You can say a blowout. Um, Georgia at, Vander, at Vanderbilt, Georgia winning this one 62 to zero, which actually these teams didn't get a chance to play last year. I don't know if y'all remember that, but um, they didn't have enough oh, yeah, players. That, yeah. Um, and so, oh, that's right. Yeah. So they, COVID. Uh, yep. So they were unable to play that one last year. So um, this one is the biggest margin of victory in 81 meetings between these two teams and that's since 1893. So it hurts. it hurts. Yeah. I think that was Vanderbilt's worst loss since like 1886 or something like that, too. <laughs> so, um, of course, you know, uh, Vanderbilt used to be quite the powerhouse back in the day. Um, but yeah, this, this is the, this is the type of game you, you want, you want to talk about rat poison. This is the type of game that will generate that mm -hmm. in a hurry. You, once you start mm -hmm. looking at the stats and you start feeling good about yourself and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's when bad things can happen. Of course, uh, obviously they, they have something to keep them focused with Arkansas this this upcoming game, but um, I didn't want to spend too much on on this one. Uh, did you guys have any thoughts, either one of you? Not surprising. I'm still. I'm just going to say it, just because I've said it in personal conversations. I'm not convinced on either quarterback at Georgia. I'm just not not convinced on the offense yet. Yeah, JT looked pretty good, but in a game like this, it's kind of like hard to evaluate. Um, just simply because you're playing different people and et cetera. Yeah. I was really excited about the tight end play in this game. There was, I think, uh, a tight end. Um, there was a, a handoff. I think there was like a, a, a trickeration, uh, double reverse or whatever, getting the, really getting the tight ends involved. And I know uh, Ben Watson was watching on the SEC Nation crew, and he was like, where was this when I was at Georgia? <laughs> He's like mm -hmm. get, getting the tight ends I'm involved. I'm excited to see what comes of uh, of this week's game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is is where we're really going to see um, what you guys have. Yeah, it would definitely be more of an indication. I think, Matt, did you have something? No, I mean, this is what Georgia should have done. Uh, you can't fault them for putting points up, which is exactly what they did. Um, the holding Vanderbilt to less than 100 yards is a bit bit extreme. <laughs> I didn't have to beat them up that bad. Um, and then 28 da first downs for their four is pretty rough. So I'm yeah, pretty sure uh, Vanderbilt much. got more yards than the Chicago Bears, though. Mm, yeah. Well, probably. so um, actually, so the defense for Georgia has scored the same number of points that they've given up this year so far. So that's oh, nice. That. <laughs> actually, that is true because the Bears this past week had 42 plays and only 47 total yards of offense. So, that's Andy, why I don't have you did any better. Chicago than... Bears on my fantasy oh. football team. <laughs> Not having uh, the Bears on my fantasy football team. Not having them. All right, right. Our, our second blowout of the day was uh, Southern Miss at Alabama. We expected this to be a blowout. Bama winning 63 to 14. I got the point in this one. Um, Jesse, what? Just jump right in. What are your thoughts on this one? I just – I still feel like our defense is getting tired. I, I don't know why, and I know it's silly because you look at the score and you're like, really, it was 63 to 14. And, yes, I understand that. But I still did not want those 14 points to be there. Um, and we actually left our, our defense in, our starters in for quite a while. And so I feel like we're getting tired. I need that to stop. And then also – I want Bryce Young to be a little bit more mobile. I know our pass game is getting so much better. He's still trying to play in that sort of Mac Jones style, uh, that Tua Tungvaluwa style. But he came in as a dual threat. And I don't know if it's something where we, we don't want to showcase that, but he doesn't seem to move well or he's just not moving well. Um, and I want to see that. I want to see him start to move a little bit more, um, scramble if he needs to. And I don't know. I, I think – Going into this week with Ole Miss, I just want to get a little more creative on offense. I think we're going to have to because you know Lane is going to. And so. Oh, yeah. That do it you, just. Do you find that he has the opportunity to run but won't take it? Like he's got an open lane, but sometimes, he'd rather throw it instead? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think he does. Um, or even just step up a little bit more. I don't know. There's, I just, I don't know. I, he's incredible. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. I like him. But I, I want to see him do that a little bit more. And I, I would like to see it from a coaching perspective, um, from offensive coordinator perspective, 
calling a little bit different plays. Like, yes, we, we definitely have to throw the ball, but sometimes I don't feel like we run the ball enough. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm finding things to pick at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so one thing that was cool in the game, Jamison Williams, the only player in the history of college football to have so two kickoff fun. returns for a touchdown and a receiving touchdown. So he can put so that on his resume. Fun. So, um, Matt, did you have any thoughts on this one? Nah, again, this it's Bama doing Bama things. Um, I'm not surprised by this score at all. In fact, I bet Coach Saban probably up down the defense a couple of times for every one of those points they gave up. So, because this should have been – 63 to nothing. Uh, Southern Miss should have not been anywhere close to scoring a touchdown in this ball game, even against the second, third string, fourth string, fifth string, or if they brought the cheerleaders out of the stands, uh, you shouldn't have given up 14 points to a team like Southern Miss. So, yeah, I, again, I feel like we haven't seen everything out of everyone yet. I, like, I don't, I can't identify who's a great team, who's a not, not a great team yet. Cause mm-hmm. I don't feel like we've seen anybody play. Well, we haven't gotten an SEC play yet. It'll be, Interesting to see what looks what it looks like once we finally start competing in the conference. You want to talk about a crazy season? I mean, was it um, so for the AP poll? Uh, Twenty five ranked teams have lost through the first four weeks of the season. Which Clemson is, lost to NC State. NC, y'all. NC State. L-O-L. And, and George, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Those those 25 losses by ranked teams is the most in the poll era, which began in 1936. So we're truly witnessing history this year with just the insanity going on and all these ranked teams losing. Playing only in conference last year, like messed with some sort of juju. <laughs> Didn't it? <laughs> I don't know what oh. it was, but it was something. Yeah. Um, all right, so that does it for last week's games. Current pick em standings, uh, I've got 17. Matt's got 14. Jesse's got 13. So we're all kind of moving along. It's uh, uh, still a lot of points out there. So um, exciting times. Um, And then let's go ahead and get to a a quick opinion segment. Sir, if I may venture an opinion. I'm not really interested in your opinion, 3 PL. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. All right, so this one just kind of came to me because I was listening to a podcast earlier today that was talking about NIL and kind of its effect on things. And we started talking about Bo Nix, and I know he's got a, an NIL deal. I can't remember who it is. It's something something Sweet Tea or something like what, whoever the company is. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I'm so sorry, I his, I shouldn't laugh. At the kid making money off of that, but the his, Sweet Tea is his his play has kind of gone downhill. Um, Spencer Rattler is another one who's got a, uh, a pretty, pretty good, uh, NIL deal. I can't remember with who, uh, but he was booed in his home stadium, uh, at Oklahoma, uh, Spencer Rattler was, um, which just has to feel great as a, uh, as a kid, uh, playing college football. So my, my, I'm not saying this is my opinion, but I, I put it out there because I'm sure there are some out there that this is their opinion that NIL is hurting the game it is hurting some players uh, whose play has dropped off since signing big deals and i mentioned the two there were several other in the podcast that they had mentioned also who have signed big deals and have experienced a drop off in play do you guys think um that nil could be the cause of this or could be something else i don't know what are your thoughts hmm. i don't know I, I would you would have to look at a list of who's signed an NI some sort of agreement with somebody versus what they've looked like this season compared to last season. It's apples and oranges, I think. I don't know if you can compare all of those different factors in one particular situation. Mm-hmm. I don't. I yeah, sense. and I I mean I guess I could see how some could think that it would hurt. They're already making money. They don't need to necessarily right. perform the way, but like these guys are still, they've worked their entire lives to get to this point. And I would assume that their dream is most of them. And especially the ones that have really big NIL deals is to get to the NFL and an NIL deal isn't going to get you to the NFL. So it'd be very silly to Mm -hmm. let that affect your play. Um, I don't, maybe it's a lack of focus and it's drawing away their focus. I'm not sure, but you would think that it would help because it's now all legal and sometimes these shady things were happening anyway. So this is less stressful because it's allowed. 
Um, and also the better you do, the more deals you, you know, theoretically yeah. will get. Right. And, and if, and it could be the case with some of these guys, but if any of these guys have, or, you know, any of these athletes across the board, uh, with NIL, um, if that causes them to not try as hard, then that's very short sighted, uh, which granted there could be some out there like that <clears throat> who don't have the focus that it might take. Uh, maybe they get some money and they're like, okay, I'm good now. Um, but it, like, as you said, it definitely should drive you to want to do more because obviously if your play uh, drops off you're not going to have that deal any longer or for not much longer. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it certainly doesn't get you set for life as, uh, as a, a career in professional sports no. would, would do or could do potentially. Um, so I think in, in response to that, uh, I think that, it's reading a little bit too much into it. I think, um, at least at this point, it's still very early to say. Um, and, yeah. and for one of those, and maybe not all of them, but for Bo Nix, I can tell you, um, we've, we've kind of suspected his play for a long time before NIL uh, mm -hmm. yeah. came in. No, okay. hate, no hate on the guy, but just watching him play, there's been uh, a lot of instances where it looks like the stage is a little bit too big. He gets happy feet. Um, he, he doesn't make, um, the right decision. And so I don't think that ha that's an NIL thing. I think that's just sort of how mm -hmm. things have gone. So, um, you have to right. understand too, they're, they're coming out of a season where they could only play in conference. They could, right. they were sequestered the whole time. We're just coming out of a pandemic. These kids are just getting back to the point where they can play out of conference games. They can have, you know, full stadiums and things like that. So it's, and yeah. <clears throat> they are college students that just dealt with a pandemic. It's been hard for everybody, but um, they're easing back into normal life. And um, I'm sure it's a, it's a hard adjustment. Yeah. Let's not underestimate the uh, effect that it's had on everybody's mental health, as you said, Absolutely. Um, just the, the past year or so. Um, and then also for uh, a lot of these um, who were freshmen last year, um, mm -hmm. this is like their first experience with these ginormous crowds of hundred thousand mm -hmm. people or more. Um, so definitely understandable to see maybe someone who as a freshman last year did great in, in a, in an environment where we could literally hear everything that the coach was saying on the sidelines, <laughs> much yep. less the quarterback calling out, you know, the, the, the count and everything. Uh, that's not the case this year, obviously. So big changes. So. All right. Well, um, um, good viewpoints there. Appreciate that. Um, let's talk about uh, the upcoming games. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble. All right. And uh, this is interesting because we talked about this big game and I know it's just how things got scheduled, uh, but the Arkansas at Georgia, number eight versus number two, uh, is noon on ESPN. So we get a big one out of the way right off the bat. So um, I, I don't know. Um, so I think Vegas has Georgia by like 18 or something like that. And I don't know. Some people were saying that that's way too much, that the game is going to be closer than that. I don't, I don't know. I could see this going both ways. I could see this being – it just depends on what Arkansas is able to do early, I think. Um, Arkansas, I think of as more of like a, a run heavy offense. And I think if our front seven can stop them as, as we've been able to do, I mean, the uh, Georgia defense, not only this year, but last year has been pretty tough on rushing attacks. Um, so if, I think if we can kind of make them one dimensional and uh, hopefully force uh, KJ Jefferson to make some, some tough throws, I think we'll be okay. And if we can do that, I think we'll, we'll win pretty decently. But, you know, that remains to be seen. So um, I, I, right now I'm going to kind of go with what, what they're kind of expecting. I've got Georgia winning this one 34 to 13. Jesse, what you got? Yeah, I, this, this prediction may be one that's like way too optimistic. But after Clemson losing to NC State, I, and even after the game, I don't think Clemson is the Clemson that we knew before. And I don't think that win is as big of a deal. And so I think this will truly be the first test for Georgia on both sides of the ball. And I'm excited to see it. 
I have a very optimistic <laughs> prediction. Uh, not quite as optimistic as Matt, but I'm going to pick UGA 28-24. What is this? What is this optimism? Why is Georgia do struggling optimism? I don't understand. No, I'm saying <laughs> uh, this is optimistic for Arkansas. Saying like I'm just messing. They'll, you know, they'll they'll be able to put up that many points and, and hang in the game that long. Yeah. I don't know if they will, but I'm I'm optimistic that they might. I got you, um, Matt. It looks like uh, you have a not so fast, my friend, coming. What you got? Up. Upset city this weekend, boys and girls. I'm going to say Arkansas wins this thing 21-20. Boy, if, if Arkansas does that, they have made they will have made all kinds of noise and basically announced, hey, we're here. I mean, they've already done they'll so. Go, they'll there's, jump to number two. There's, there's so much riding on this game. This is Pittman's – I think this is Pittman's first game back at Georgia since he got the helm in Arkansas, isn't it? Um, I think so. I think in Athens, yeah. I think in Athens, so yeah, you got that going for you. This is an afternoon game. This is not an evening game. If this was a night game, I'd probably pick UGA, uh, because Sanford Stadium after after dark is a little bit different than during the day. I think most people are still going to be trying to wake up, still trying to get over the night before. I think that's going to play a factor here too. Um, I just there's too many. There's too many variables here, and I don't think. And, and I'm, I'll be frank with you, I'm, I agree with Jesse. I don't think the quarterbacks are up to par yet, and I think that that's what's going to get exploited. I think Arkansas wins this thing, twenty-one twenty. You know, there's so so much interesting going on here, and you know, it's got to be tough um, from a coaching standpoint because if I was Kirby, um, I would be I would be super proud for Sam and be like, this is awesome. This guy left. Uh, nobody thought he was going to pan out as a head coach, probably his only chance as a, at a head coaching gig and look at what he's done. And it would be such a mix of emotions because I would be super proud for the guy, right? Super happy for him. At the same time, I've got to get my team prepped to beat him. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot going on there and just uh, an interesting feel to that game for sure. Um, all right, let's get to uh, Tennessee at Mizzou. Um, and that both of those teams at two and two right now. Uh, that's a noon kickoff on SEC Network. Um, this is tough. I think it could kind of go both ways, but I think Tennessee is going to win a close one here. Um, I think Vegas is picking uh, Mizzou, though. But I don't know. I think Tennessee's got something here. I, I think I've watched Mizzou struggle. I think Tennessee has a chance. I'm going to go with UT winning this one 34 to 31. Jesse, what you got? Yeah, I I have more optimism using that word again. Um, coming out of last week for Tennessee than I do Mizzou, to be honest with you. Yeah. So I'm going to pick the Vols as well um, in a close one, 21-17. All right, Matt. I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty confident that the Vols are going to win this ball game. They've won two straight, and then I think four out of the last six. I think it is. So we've done a pretty good job in the series over the last couple of years. So I'm going to say Tennessee wins this thing 24-28. All right. Um, next, we have Ole Miss at Bama. Ole Miss, uh, number 12, 3-0. Bama, number one, 4-0. That's a 3-30 SEC game on CBS. Um, so so I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry, Jesse. I, I was just... reading this outline, and I was like, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> and here's the thing. Like – if I had to pick, if I had to pick one team this year that had a shot, it would probably be Ole Miss. Um, I just think that that Lane has an understanding of how to beat Bama, and they almost did it last year um, uh, yeah. in, in a shootout. Um, and then I, I let my mind wander, and obviously it's way too early for this, but I, I started thinking. Gosh, what if Georgia makes it to the SEC? What if Ole Miss is the representative from the West? I don't know if we have anything for Ole Miss either because, truthfully, the, the weakness in our defense has been the secondary. And you get Matt Corral running around a little bit, loosen up the, the secondary a little bit, and before you know it, he's torching the defense. And I, Ole Miss has got some potential here, um, not just for this game but beyond. So, um, I don't know. If I had to pick anybody to beat Bama this year, it would probably be Ole Miss. I've got them winning in the upset, forty-two to thirty-five. I'm sorry, Jesse. Don't hate me, please. What do you? Got? I I can't. I I physically, emotionally, and spiritually cannot lose to Lane Kiffin. Yeah. I 
I cannot do it. First, I will not do it. He would be the first, first Saban disciple. He would be, and I can't, he is just such a Twitter troll that you know he probably has <laughs> tweets lined up just in case. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Um, <laughs> I'm obviously not going to pick Ole Miss. Um, I'm going to pick Bama. I do think it'll be close, but I'm praying since it's at Bryant Denny that we'll be able to get it done. I'm also surprised that it's a 3.30 game and not like a 7 o'clock, but whatever. Um, picking Bama, 38-27. Yeah, I guess a lot of times what the SEC game of the week is on CBS at that 3.30 slot. So I guess that's why. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Matt, what you got? I, I really want Ole Miss to win this game. I'll be completely honest with you. I want, I'm want. i sorry, Jesse. I want Ole Miss to win. I want somebody <laughs> to finally knock Nick Saban off of his pedestal. And it would be appropriate he if it's – He has um, very tender hips. Don't be knocking <laughs> him anywhere. I hope he breaks, breaks both of them. <gasps> um, yeah, I – Said it. One is titanium. It. That's true. That would be care. a little bit more difficult. <laughs> but just anyway, bounce on that side. If, if it, and I find it, I think it would be appropriate if it's Lane that finally is the assistant that knocks off Saban. I think it would be appropriate given, you know, the leaving him at the hotel and the natural just kind of contention that was between those two while he was the OC at Alabama. So did, I, did I, he I ever get spanked? Him. I know the quarterback got spanked. Did Lane ever get spanked? AJ's the only one that got spanked. Um, okay. Lane, we just didn't let him talk to the press. Yeah, right. <laughs> he got a, he got a um, he got a butt chewing on the sidelines several times, as I recall. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> of course, everybody has, I suppose. Anyway, I I, I want Ole Miss to win, but I know Bama's going to do Bama things, so I'm saying Bama wins this thing, 45-35. All right. Um, I'm excited either way. I think it's going to be a, a fun game to watch. So um, next we have Troy at two and two at South Carolina, also at two and two, three thirty on SEC network. Um, this one actually is expected to be pretty close and Troy, I think has played a lot of people tough. Um, so I am uh, going to go with South Carolina winning this one, but fairly close. I got South Carolina 27, 20, Jesse. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a pretty even matchup here. So I'm going to pick um, the Gamecocks 17 to 14. Okay, Matt? Troy doesn't stand a chance in this game. This is a Troy team that's lost to Liberty and Louisiana Monroe this season. So Liberty is two freeze. Yeah. Eh, eh, details. They were ranked last um, year. I, I just don't, I don't see it happening. I just don't see it happening. So I'm going to pick Carolina 28-10. All right. Um, next, we have number 10, Florida at 3-1 and one at Kentucky at 4-0, and oh, 6 o'clock on ESPN. Man, I really want to pick Kentucky in this one. And I, 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 hope, pick I hope they win yeah. regardless. I would gladly uh, – of course, I guess if, if we all – then we're all – No one gets the point. The point. I'm fine <laughs> with that. I, I would be okay with that, yeah. But um, I do think Florida's probably going to – uh, going to uh, edge them at the uh, – maybe not at the end, but I think it'll be kind of close, uh, but they'll still win. I got Florida winning this one, 31 to 24. Jesse? Yeah, I want to pick Kentucky. I just can't because I'm behind in the pick them, so I don't feel like doing that. Um, I'm going to pick the Gators, 34 to 21. Uh, Kentucky's got to hold on to the ball. Otherwise, it will get out of control very quickly. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Matt? I really, 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 really hope Kentucky finds a way to pull this off, but I just don't think it's going to happen. So I'm going to say Florida wins 28-20. Okay. All right. Next, we have Mississippi State at 2-2 two and two at number number 15, Texas A&M at 3-1. and one. That's 7 o'clock on SEC Network. Um, yeah, I think A&M bounces back a little bit here. Um, but again, I wouldn't be surprised if Mississippi State made a, a close game of it. And the way, especially the way AM tackled in that last game, man, if uh, Will Rogers throws it 70 something times and they can't tackle, uh, who knows? Uh, but I think uh, I'm going to go with AM uh, able to kind of get it back together here, uh, winning 27 to 20. Jesse? Yeah, I, I think AM is going to be pretty mad about last week. I think they're going to come in here and try to really make a statement and this is to be a state I just don't have confidence in I'm picking Texas A&M 30 to 17. Okay Matt. I was about to do something really dumb and then I don't remember do we were it. talking about Texas A&M. Uh, we have been overly at impressed Kyle with what we've seen at A&M. Yeah we haven't but we haven't seen a lot out of A&M that we like. Um, we've talked about how the quarterback plays not there. I was about to pick 
A&M to win this thing big, but I don't think that's going to happen. So I'm going to say final score is Texas A&M still going to win, but I'm going to say 28 to 10 is your final. Okay. All right. Next we have UConn at 0 and 5 at Vanderbilt at 1 and 3. Somebody's got to win this game. So um, that's <laughs> 7 seven thirty on ESPNU. Now, um, is it wasn't UConn one of the teams that was in the uh, in the basement yep. when Arkansas yep. was there? Yep. And it wasn't wasn't it the UConn person that was reading the book um, yep. uh, FBS football when to give it up or <laughs> whatever? Yep. Um, yeah, they're constantly in the bottom ten on ESPN. I don't know what's going on up uh, up at UConn, but uh, it ain't good things in the football basketball. department. Basketball. Women's I guess, basketball. I guess that I guess maybe that's the focus. I don't know, but um, which you know that's awesome. But in the football department, not so much. Um, I got Van- Vandy winning this one. Clark Lee gets his second win at uh, at Vanderbilt, and uh, they win thirty three to eighteen. Jesse, what you got? I have considered picking Vandy to lose, but then I saw UConn's record, and I was like, ah, they'll probably do this one. <laughs> yeah, I was um, that way too. Yeah, I was like, mm. but I'm picking Vandy. Uh, 24 to 17 and honestly I'm not even confident in that pick I don't even know how many scores are going to happen it may be very hard <laughs> all right uh, Matt what you got man listen this is like the the, the toilet bowl that's what we should be calling this game because both these brought to you by Clorox <laughs> um, I, I thought about picking UConn and then I went back and looked at who they had played and who they had lost to they got nuked by Fresno State. They got nuked by Purdue. Army beat them like they stole money from them. The only game that's been relatively close was against Wyoming, who's also an awful football team. Um, Go so, folk. yeah, this uh, <laughs> this isn't going to end well. This is not going to be a very pretty game, I would imagine, but I'm going to pick Vanderbilt and say 2017 is your final. All right. Um, and then the final game of the evening. And, look, I know this is in LSU – but nine o'clock still seems late. I don't know. Um, number twenty-two well, Auburn. That's nine. P- that's nine p.m. Eastern, so it would only. That's be true. I mean, that's fair. Eight but... o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock Eastern, or it's eight o'clock time. Central. So yeah, eight o'clock central. for both that's of them. But still, yeah, it's a late game. So number twenty-two Auburn, three and one at LSU, three and one nine o'clock on ESPN. But man, what a storyline, right? You got T.J. Finley, uh, who I expect to start. I don't know. I haven't heard. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so he's got a homecoming there to LSU. It's at night in death Valley. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be crazy. Um, both of these teams have had their struggles. Um, but I think LSU is going to come out on top in this one, uh, 30 to 24. Jesse. Somehow they both lose. <laughs> I don't know how, but somehow they both lose. Um, I wish if only um, <laughs> it could feel like a loss. In, I know. I know it's in death Valley, but if TJ Finley starts, I think he's just going to be like really trying to show it and prove it to his team or yeah. his former team. I think Auburn, I don't know. They both are. This is a very evenly matched team. Obviously they have the same record, but I just feel like talent wise, they they're evenly matched. But somehow I think Auburn pulls it out and it's very close. Um, and there's a safety involved and yeah. Auburn, Auburn wins 24, 23. I felt like you almost talked yourself out of that like three times while you were talking. I did. So. I kept going back and forth in my head. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It, <laughs> oh man. Uh, Matt, what you got? Listen, I, I, I think Auburn got a little bit of a wake up call this week against uh, Georgia state. I think Auburn's going to end up coming out of this looking a little hot. Um, I think they're going to be able to fix whatever problems they had. They're going to get some practice into the belts. And I think Auburn's actually going to win this thing fairly large. So I'm saying Auburn wins 35-14. I don't right. care if it is a night game. And LSU's not that good this year. Yeah. I guess we'll Careful find out. LSU fans will get you so offended. You, well, they can get offended, but y'all lost to, to UCLA. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I, they can get all – I'll take Didn't you UCLA want. just That's... lose to Stanford? Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so there's there's my point. LSU's not that good this year. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm excited about this this week's slate of games. There's some good ones. Um, all right. So just for fun, uh, it's now time for the just for fun segment. And 
Today's subject is what is each SEC head coach's favorite TV or movie one-liner or quote? And I really like this one. So this one comes because if you haven't seen it on the Manning, Eli and Peyton show or whatever, um, Eli did the ma. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, so these were randomly assigned. Um, so I got, uh, first of all, I got Mike Leach and I think obviously Mike Leach loves pirates, uh, but he also loves being profound, right? So I think he's going to go with the profound pirate quote, not all treasure is silver and gold, mate, by none other than who, uh, Jesse? Jack Sparrow <laughs> from Pirates of the Caribbean. The first yep. One. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I think I think he he likes that one. Um, and then Dan Mullen, I think this sh should come as no surprise. Uh, Dan Mullen's favorite line is, "I don't know if I ought to go sailing down no hill with nothing between my ground and brains but a piece of government plastic." Cousin Eddie. By cousin Eddie, of course, because he is cousin Eddie. And okay. then his other one is, "You serious, Clark?" So. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we got Shane Beamer and I don't know when I was listening to uh, Shane talk about the dogs after they had played, I, this reminded me, it's not really necessarily a TV show, but it certainly was on TV quite a bit back in the day. Um, so enjoy this quote. But they are who we thought they were and we let them off the hook. Rest in peace, Dennis Green. That's a, yeah. such, a, such a great quote. Um, all right, and then finally, I had uh, Coach O, Ed Orgeron, and uh, this is definitely his favorite movie quote. I get right there, Kalei. All right, all right. Lead off, baby. I know that. Now we're with that kind of fuck around. We're going to get to a boot call at my back. Because <laughs> it's his favorite because he yeah. understands every word of it. That's why. And it probably is really funny. It probably is really. And um, on alternative... <laughs> An alternative quote for him would be "chew him a little bit." So chew him a little bit. Yeah. Chew him. Oh man. Yep. All right, Matt. Um, share with the class who you have and and their choices. Uh, so I these are these were hard because I had to think of movies and I had to go back anyway. <laughs> so for Drinkwitz, Coach Drinky, because he's such a bloody nerd, I decided to go with something uh, a little bit of the nerd nip for him. So I said, "May the Force be with you." From Star Wars is obviously. Uh, his favorite uh, one-liner or quote. Obviously. Um, Brian Harson, looking at the rest of that SEC West schedule, I think Ooh. he's saying to himself, you're going to need a bigger boat or That's you're going to need one. a better quarterback is probably what he's thinking. That's a good um, one. And let's be, fr let's be frank, Coach, you are going to need a bigger boat when you run into Arkansas and Alabama and all of them. Um, for Clark Lee, I said, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Because <laughs> if you remember, Clark Lee used to be the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame. Right. And I think he's figured out that he's not in Kansas anymore, especially with that awful thing that they play for. They call defensive in Nashville. Um, <laughs> Kirby Smart, I went with a TV show. I went with uh, the Hulk and said, you don't want to make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. And then he turns green. He's always angry. Um, yeah, Kirby Smart's a very angry individual. <laughs> and then Sam Pittman in the middle of the re resurrection of of uh, Arkansas's uh, football <laughs> glory says it's alive, alive. So that's that was mine. I love that. And you're like, um, so uh, is, has the monster come to life? Yes, oh. we'll, see. <laughs> we'll have a better understanding after they play Georgia this weekend. I love it. All right, Jesse, uh, what do you have? So I have um, Coach Heupel, which I decided to go with Monty Python and the Holy Grail with is merely a flesh wound because i feel like after the losses he's like it's just a flesh wound it's okay um and i'm not gonna lie i think my eyes got crossed when i looked at mark stoops and i read sam Pittman while finding mark stoops and so that's why i put here's jenny from the shining i was waiting to see how yes you were gonna work that in there yeah, the yes sir and the here's johnny inflection was similar to me so that was meant for Sam Pittman and not Mark Stoops. Um, <laughs> so, oops. And then um, Nick Saban, he's, it's going to be classic, obviously. Um, he's going with, frankly, my dear, 
I don't give a damn. Um, Which is basically also, his response to every press question. Basically, yeah, I was about to say, he's I, saying that to every, every reporter that ever asked him a question, he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Yes. And I thought he would also like, there's no crying in baseball. But <laughs> I only picked one. Um, Jimbo Fisher, because he's just... <laughs> And he's like trying to bond with the players. And I'm still not over Jameis Winston and all that mess. Um, he is not like other moms. I'm a cool mom. He's the mean girl's mom trying to relate to the players. You know, like I'm cool. Like it's cool. We can hang out. Um, hate him. <laughs> and then Lane Kiffin doesn't quote the movie. He just goes into bars and sings You've Lost That Loving Feeling to girls um, like mm-hmm. they did in Top Gun. That's not, that's not like Kiffin does, does that though. That's Joy Freshwater. Right, that's true. Yeah, right. Joey Freshwater. Um, sure which if you know they've they've never been seen in the same room. It's true. That's true. This this is why my my face hurts after every show because I'm just like laughing the whole time. So good times. Um all right. Well, uh, that does it for this week's episode. If you guys would like to contact us, please hit us up on email at pigskinsandpeasantry at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook.com slash pigskins and pageantry we can be found on twitter at ppsec podcast and also on instagram at pigskins and pageantry don't forget we are available for download on itunes stitcher tune in radio and most podcasting apps for iphone android and other operating systems uh now part of the blue wire hustle program super excited about that uh, if you guys enjoy the show please subscribe and review we'd love a five-star review give us visibility and tell everybody how awesome we are. We appreciate that. So until next time, this is Wes. Lots of exciting games coming up. Go dogs. I will not lose to Lane Kiffin. (laughs) I physically can't uh, roll tide y'all. Please let's beat our Missouri this week. I just don't, I can't lose to a guy named coach drinky. I just can't do it. (laughs) So, and uh, uh, go rebels. (laughs) <laughs> Stop! Uh, I'll say I'm putting the voodoo on you, Jesse. Go I'm calling HR. Oh, they ain't going to listen to you. <laughs> Go balls. We'll see you guys later. <laughs>